Welcome to Popcorn Talk, featuring movie discussions, news, and interviews, presenting the film scene with Ileana Douglas. Ileana is an actress, writer, author, and film historian with a need to discuss movies that borders on obsession. You'll learn the history of movies one great story at a time. The film scene is the deep cuts of movie podcasts, featuring movies we love by the people who made them. And now, Ileana Douglas. Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Fiends film scene, and uh, it's great to see everyone. Hi, Jeff. How's it going? Ileana Douglas, it's better now that I'm seeing you. Excited for today's show. Thank you. Thank you. I'm going summer with my uh, summer t-shirt. A shout out to uh, Connecticut. This was one of the first summer jobs I ever had as a kid. Eat oysters, love longer. We know that's true. Um, (laughs) On this oyster house on State Street in Hartford, Connecticut. I lasted four days, and on the fourth day, the establishment went on strike to unionize. So there you go. I, I, I went. I went all Norma Ray. It was a great. Uh, <laughs> it was a really funny experience. But I only lasted four days, and then when we went on strike, um, one funny thing that happened was Bill O'Reilly was then before he became the Bill O'Reilly used to be a newscaster. He was a newscaster in Hartford, WTIC. And I remember we were on the strike line, you know, I didn't know anything. I was like 17 or something. Yeah. But anyway, he uh, he crossed the picket line and he said, get a job, scum. That sounds <laughs> on brand for Bill O'Reilly. Right? So even back in the day, yeah. He had his brand and he was sticking to it. I'll never forget that. Did you have the immediate thought of, he seems like he'd be a great backbone for a shady cable news network when that happened? It's funny you mentioned that. Yes, immediately (laughs) after he, after he, you know, spat on us and went into Hannes's Oyster House to have his fine meal. Um, And I think even when he came out to get out of here, I said, that guy needs to be on on TV. Um, anyway, I want to talk about the most Im- 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 monumental thing that has happened in, uh, you know, very sad, although he had a great run, is uh, the passing of Carl Reiner. Yeah. I can't think of another person who's more instrumental to comedy, comedy writing, directing, uh, mentoring so many people. His partnership and his relationship with Mel Brooks from the records, 2000 year old man, uh, to your show of shows, to his own directing career, working with people like Steve Martin. And then, you know, having amazing offspring uh, like Rob Reiner, what a legacy to comedy. Um, I have a couple interesting stories about Carl Reiner because I got to interview him for Turner Classic Movies and he was in the service. My grandfather was in the service and my grandfather produced a show called Call Me Mister and which he recruited people in the in the armed services for this uh, show and it later went to you know later went to Broadway. Well one of the people he discovered was Carl Reiner. Wow. Yeah and uh He went in the show and called me Mr. And they later kind of ran and, you know, got in touch with each other. I think my grandfather, at one point, he hosted Caesar's Hour. They worked with Carl Reiner again. So when I was going to interview Carl Reiner, we talked about this on the phone. So he was telling me stories about my grandfather. I mean, again, I just thought this is such an incredible thing. And when I interviewed him, he was promoting, he's written so many books but this one is called Why and When the Dick Van Dyke Show Was Born. And he wrote the inscription on the inside, which is so sweet. He says, to Ileana, my second encounter with a Douglas. <laughs> How cool is that? I know. Isn't that great? And it, much love, Carl Reiner. The um, thing that's crazy about Carl Reiner, too, is just how he managed to stay in the spotlight. I mean, like... I like the Steven Soderbergh Ocean, Ocean's Eleven oh. remakes, and he's he's in fantastic in those. You know, like that's an example. I think he's in his nineties when he's doing that. He yeah. plays an important role in those movies, and a lot of times, you know, film will take the old person, either make them a joke or 
you know, I, it's sad to see sometimes what this industry does with older people, but he's, he's really, really great in those movies, you know? I think so. He, he had an amazing facility to keep reinventing himself. Yeah. Um, and even um, on Twitter, to be, you know, this sage voice of reason um, was so delightful. And his PSAs about voting, I, I just think what, you know, what an, what an important member of, um, of comedy. And he was writing books in his, in his 90s. These are a couple of his books, if anybody ever wants to, you know, take a look at them. My Anecdotal Life, which again, talks about his starting, you know, he, he was an actor, he was a second banana, and then transferring over and becoming a writer and the success of the Dick Van Dyke show, and then becoming a successful director again uh, later on in his life. This is another one great book he wrote called Carl Reiner, What I Forgot to Remember, which is, <laughs> which is other little anecdotes. Um, and it's got some beautiful pictures in it, but when you meet someone of that generation, somebody who went through World War II, went through the 50s, um, it's really just kind of sad as we look you know, forward towards the future. And my, my first introduction in comedy, I always tell people, was listening to my parents, listening to the 2000 and year old man. And I, listening to those comedy records and hearing them laugh, and I didn't really understand the jokes but I understood that people got together in a room and they listened to something and it made them laugh. Wow. And I thought, I want to be, that's what I want to do. I want to make yeah. people laugh, you know? And um, I listened to those records just absolutely religiously. They're, they're, they're so great. Um, and I love some of his movies. I mean, when I think of him in the jerk with the bit, with the glasses, I, you know, it's, so many great moments. Dead men don't wear plaid. Uh, just an incredible, you know, incredible director. Did plays, did it all. He really so, did. Yeah, it's I think show. another cool thing about Carl Reiner is of course we're a film podcast, but I view him as one of the first, along with Lucy, influential voices in television. I mean, like to me, he was Norman Lear before Norman Lear. Absolutely. I, I mean, the, you know, he didn't, I mean, although he didn't quite, invent the sitcom i was i wrote on twitter that he practically did because he he formalized it in a way you know that i don't think we've changed from the things that he put into it you know the yeah. idea of having a writer's room of taking things from your own life and putting those um into the show i just think are were revolutionary you're right I mean, you look at, I know you had a nice arc on the Gary Shandling show and a show like that would never exist without the Dick Van Dyke show. Mary Tyler Moore would never exist without the Dick Van Dyke show, you know? No, absolutely not. Um, and, you know, giving Mary Tyler Moore a, a chance and and you, the utilization of Dick Cavett in, that sh in this show, I mean, it was just, it's all a part of my childhood. And I think that that's why, which is one of the things I was talking to him about how comedy has changed. And he was saying, that they had a longer, that because the comedy was, uh, they had a longer, you know, ability to, to do the show. I mean, they, now it's, there's so many commercials. He said, you only have about 20 minutes, so you don't have the time to actually lay down a plot, you know, and, and, and actually take advantage of some things. And he, he felt that that was part of the reason that comedy has suffered is that it needs, you need time to set things up. I love that. Well, speaking of sitcoms, of course, our guest Perry Gilpin is known for her run on sitcoms. I think we should go ahead and bring her in, Eliana. Let's bring Perry Gilpin in. We're going to have a lot of surprises. I haven't seen Perry in quite a while, but uh, we work together as we will as we will discuss on the show. Um, yes. but I just want to give Perry is, of course, one of TV's most recognizable faces, known of course for playing Roz on Frasier. But she's also been in shows like Make It or Break It, Hot in Cleveland, Broad City, the Law and Order franchise, and her new series is The Old Guy. So welcome to the show, Perry Gilpin. Hi. Hi, Eliana. How are you? Can you hear me? 
I'm, yeah. I can hear you. I'm not well, Perry. No, I'm <laughs> good. <laughs> Actually, let's just talk about my personal problems. You're really? You're in lockdown. No, I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. I mean, as as well as we can all be, not having uh, anyone to perform to, or you know, being isolated. It's like it was my worst nightmare of being uh, not around any people or being able to perform. Um, I uh, do you know about this thing called Cameo? You heard about that? Yes, yes, yes. Where you leave a message for do a, a phone message? Yes. Yeah, so I did it, and you know, I thought it would be a fun way of me giving back to I, you know, give my proceeds to World Kitchen. And I, as I always tell the people when I do the videos, I go, "This is like the most acting I'll do this year." So <laughs> I'm putting everything. You're getting the best of me because this is this will be the only movie I make this year is for you. So. Uh, I'm having. A, I'm. I think it's fun because I actually get to. Um, I get to perform on it. But how are you coping with COVID? You've got kids at least, so it's yeah, really yeah. And they're 16. They turned 16 during this time in in May, and they're they're kind of the perfect age in a way for it because they were really tired and they slept for the first month, and then they you know and they they're in the 10th grade, so they. You know, they did school online and they, they dealt with it really well. They adapted. But I, I know that it was harder for older kids and then younger kids. Oh, my gosh. I don't know how, and, you know, homeschooling. Yeah, I, can, you know? I can't even imagine it. I, I, I looked at the tests. They seem impossible. I mean, some friends of mine that are struggling trying to figure out geography. Yeah. And, and how the teacher kids, you know, they don't want to learn from you necessarily you know they have to they they learn from everything you do but like sitting down with your kids to teach them something that's not that's not easy yeah my parents were teachers so they were and they were like the worst teachers ever <laughs> <laughs> they had no patience at all you know every time I would say to my father that's not what we're learning he's like what you're learning is wrong <laughs> <laughs> Okay. I actually, can I go back to studying now what I need to study? <laughs> and thank you. That's what mine say. It's like, don't just, an I just answered this one question. Do not go into a full lecture. Just one. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to do the test. Go back to riding my bike. Um, okay, Perry, we always start the show with my favorite question. Uh, you were born in Waco, Texas, right? Do you remember the first movie you saw and who took you to see it? Well, I don't remember it, but it's a very famous story in my family. It's okay. Kind of gross. But my mom and dad went to see Houdini when I was an infant. I had just been born and I guess I farted. And so she was embarrassed and held me up so everyone could see that it was the baby that did it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. I can't believe I just told that. But uh, she was 19. You know, she was really young. They were both in college at Baylor. Wow. And they were, you know, they were my, they, they it was their first outing after birth. Yeah. In the summer. It was hot, I'm sure. And so, cause I was born in the end of May. So that was my first time I saw a movie, but I have so many great movie stories. Like later she was the head of the youth group at our church and she took us all, me and in, included to, with the youth group, the teenagers to see Hush, Hush, Sweet Charlotte. And Ooh. I was terrified forever more after that. Yeah. And my grandfather like snuck off with my sister and me and took us to see Bonnie and Clyde and they nearly killed him for that because we saw that <laughs> way too young. What did you think about the ending? When you, I mean, were you oh, just the bloodbath at the end? <laughs> was, yeah. What? I didn't even see that because I first saw Bonnie and Clyde on television. The whole <laughs> ending was, you know, I didn't know. It was all cut. Wasn't it until years later I saw the movie? I was like, "Oh my god!" Uh, I saw. Wasn't it Sam Peckinpah? I don't. Was that Sam? It was the second. No, it's hard, it's hard to end, but it's all slow motion blood. <laughs> yeah, totally. Out and, yeah, they were like El Wood. They were so mad at him for doing that. And then my <laughs> my favorite movie story is us all getting dressed up and going to see Sound of Music, like in our finest, going to you know Sunday school clothes. It was such an event and it was worth it. It was so great. Oh, I can imagine. Yeah, that, mo that movie still holds up. They had it at the Turner Classic Movies a few years ago and Julie Andrews and Chris Plummer were there in attendance and it was quite emotional. 
just to see it on the big, something about seeing a movie on a big screen. I don't know, I hope, hopefully one of these, one of these years we'll be back to seeing movies together, you know? You know, there's the big sing-along sound of music at the Hollywood Bowl. Yes. So that, I did that one year with the, with the whole family. It was so much fun. Isn't it fun? Yes. Oh, I hope we can do that soon. They might have, uh, I'm hoping, you know, they said that some, some drive-ins may start up again. So I would, I would definitely be into going to a drive-in. I love, my dad used to do his radio show from the Gemini drive-in, like right in the middle of Dallas. And we'd go uh -huh. see him and see a show. It was so much fun. And I saw, the last time I saw a show at a drive-in was Urban Cowboy at the Gemini in Dallas with my whole high school class, my senior class. We, it was so much fun. Why did those go away? That was I don't so know. Fun. My whole, I wrote in my book, my whole, my whole social life revolved around going to the drive-in. We went to the drive-in and you know, around the, there was like a hamburger stand in the middle and everybody, we would, you know, sneak in. Again, it was always so funny because it was only a dollar, but we would get, there'd be like eight of us and someone's Pontiac, you know, and then there'd always be that thing where the, the friend would always pretend that they weren't going to open the trunk. And, you know, like, it was like a ritual every single time, but it turned into, um, and then it was funny because sometimes, I don't know if you had this, but most of the time it was like me and a crowd of girls and we would go in and we meet the boys at the hamburger stand. Or if you really got lucky, you met them at the swings. That was like, the swing. uh, that was the makeout spot. Yeah. Right. <laughs> but then later on, then sometimes you would be se separately, you would go on a date with a boy, but you'd see your friends. And I always wanted to be, I was like, this is a mistake. I think I'd rather be with my girlfriends, you know, because they were, they, those boys were not interested in the movie, I, surprisingly. I, I, <laughs> Maybe that's why they went away. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I said, it was, uh, it was hard to make a case, though, for watching. I was like, ah, stop it. I'm trying to watch burnt offerings <laughs> here. You know? You're right. The reincarnation of Peter Proud is really important to me. Um, so before, did you always want to be an actor? Or was that, uh, you know, was that your ambition? Yeah, I did. I, I wanted to since I was eight. My mom was a school teacher too. And oh, that's funny. She, as long as she was a school teacher, I wanted to be a school teacher. And then when I was about eight, she remarried uh, and, she, and, and she stopped teaching. She'd been teaching special ed for like six years and she just burned out. So that's she so, went That's what my mom taught. My mom taught special ed. She, well, they would team teach. She and another young teacher would have 60 kids. They, they would, um, you know, combine. They had 60 between them. And she, and once she had experience in that, she, I'm sure your mom was the same way. Once she had experience, that was really, she could not teach a class that wasn't special ed, you know? Yeah. yeah. She had an affinity for that again, because it was the seventies. It had the unfortunate name of LD. They learning. Right. They call it LD and right. anybody was in LD. I mean, people who were poor, you know, they're, they're people, you know, dyslexia hadn't been diagnosed. recognized yet. So you had a wide spectrum of people that would be put in LD, you know, it's unfortunate. Yeah. Yeah. They didn't know how to handle it at all. No. So she, she went and she, she pursued her original dream, which was, was, which was acting. And, um, and so, and I saw her, she did a production of Picnic Oh, at wow. like our community theater in Houston where, where we lived at the time. And we yeah. went and my sister would, she was midge and my mom was just standing on the porch, staring off into space as the lights came down, you know, and my sister goes, mama, like that. <laughs> 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 so, so I was bit, I wanted to be on that stage after I saw her play that part. Well, what a great play to see. I love Picnic is one of my, I love that play. Uh, I love the lang the William Inge language. His stuff has gone a little bit out of fashion. People sort of know more Tennessee Williams, but I love William Inge. All you know, Anteus just did a production of Picnic a couple of years ago that my friend Cam directed. It was great. It was so good. You know, everyone went crazy for it. Yeah, it's got the, the whole, the, 
you know, the young people, the old people. I love uh, Rosemary, you know, the, uh, in the movie, it was uh, Roz Russell. You gotta yes. marry me, Howard. You gotta marry me. It's so pathetic. The old yes. maid in town and, uh, I, and the movie I love too, with Kim, no incredible Kim Novak. Um, did you have, when you were watching movies growing up, did you have an affinity for comedy and, or, or did you just want to be an actress? I just wanted to be an actress. I, I, I was of that mind that, you know, you weren't a real actress if you, if, if you were co a comedic actress, that that wasn't real. I didn't understand yeah. it. And so I, 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 I remember going to see Cabaret and I had Liza Minnette, the, the soundtrack, the album. Yeah, and me too. I entered my room and seeing those songs. Did you, and I knew I, I wanted to be Sally Bowles. I, I didn't, I don't even think I wanted to be Liza Minnelli. I think I wanted to be Sally Bowles, you know? Yes. I, I just would, it would just fill me. I wanted to be in that movie, you know, get in there with it. <laughs> it's so fun. We never had this discussion. That's all in my book. That's how I got my first job. I, I learned the song from the record. Oh my God, really? I, okay, I'm reading your book. It sounds like we- Yeah, and then I went to the audition and I didn't have sheet music. I, I, had oh. the, I mean, I had the sheet music, but I didn't. it didn't match the record at all. I learned it. That's what I joked to them. That's how I got the part. I said, it's the key of Liza. I don't know any other key. You know? <laughs> and could you sing in the key? Could you? Yeah, I, key, that was the whole story I tell in the book. I was like, I was totally lost and, I just kept saying, well, that's the key. It's the key of Liza. And they were laughing. So they, they were kind of like, no, the kids got moxie. So let's, and they ended up, they got, one of the guys said, well, why don't you sing and I'll play. And then he, st I started to sing and he started to play. And he said, he said very quietly, you're in C by the way. And I said, yeah, like I said, key of Liza. And oh, I got a huge laugh, you know, kids got moxie. And, Give her the part. Yeah. I wish it had worked at other times. You know, the funny thing about show business is, believe me, I've tried that other times. And they're like, yeah, thank you. Uh, can you send that? Next. Please send in Perry Gilpin now, please. Yeah. Do you remember that time we were auditioning and we in, in that trailer? Yes. And you were in the room and you're like, I know Perry Gilpin's listening to me right now. And I yelled through the wall, no, I'm not. I think I'm... <laughs> I know, and I was thinking, I said, how can two people that are so good, it's like so funny and done so well, like why are we even here? Like you should just be writing a show for me and very good, you know, but like that's what I mean, sometimes auditioning just seems like, really? Or why are we even auditioning with this? What we did that day was funnier than anything we could have written, you know? Oh God, but yeah, like I said, it doesn't always work that way as the, as you know, that's when I was a kid. Um, the, uh, so when, at what point did you move? Did you move to California first or did you go to New York first? I went to London first and studied oh, okay. and, and I got, I got kicked out of University of Texas cause they didn't like my acting. So I auditioned at SMU, I, I, not SMU, I, I knew about it from a friend of this program in, in London that Michael Shulman from New York was sort of doing this. He wrote the books Audition and yeah. he was sort of somehow putting together an exchange program through Duke. And a friend of mine was at Duke and she said, I'm going to go to London. So I called the head of the department at SMU, Jenna Worthen, and I said, can I please come to you? and work on a, a Shakespearean monologue. I want to go to New York and audition for this school in London. And she said, per, you know, Perry, being an actress is really hard, you know? And I go, I know, I just got kicked out of UT like yesterday. And she goes, okay, I'll see you in the morning. Like, as long as you know, you're just, this is, this is hard, you know? But so I worked with her and I auditioned and the guy took me to London and it was fantastic. And so then when I came back, I had to make the decision between New York and LA. And I decided to go to New York because I still wanted to do theater so much. And I started off as a apprentice at Williamstown and I wound up going back there every summer for like five summers and then moving to New York from there. Mm. But it was literally like, you know, Melissa Gilbert was doing a Shana Madel off Broadway and Madonna was doing Speed the Plow on Broadway. Wow. And I, I, I couldn't even get an audition. So I thought I'm gonna go to LA and 
and it was the right thing only I got here and then the writers went on strike. <laughs> so um, then it was sort of back and forth for a little while, but I just would audition so much more here. I just had so many more opportunities to actually work, mm -hmm. you know? So I, I did that thing where we were bi-coastal, you know, like yes. that work. Cause you couldn't, if you were a kid or a young actor trying to get your, your first jobs, you couldn't you could afford to get on a plane to go back and forth, you know, and you, they couldn't let you know in time. You had to be where you were so you could get there and, and audition, so. Did you have that experience like I did while I was in New York where you would, um, like you said, we were bi-coastal, but where you'd, they'd fly you out and you'd be one of three people testing for a pilot? Like again, back in the old days, there was money and they'd fly you out and they'd put you up at the Universal Hilton with your competitors. Yeah. And the next day, you know, you'd work, you'd all three be there working with the Purdue, the director, whatever, you'd all go in one at a time. And then, you know, you'd go back to the hotel and you'd wait for the call. Oh, I've done it. I've been through it, but never flown in to do that. You know, I did it from here, but it's the worst because you become friends with these people. It's not the worst. It's great. Where you're, it's great. It's just, uh, it's an unusual circumstances to be in. Right. Well, I would always know I was, I would look at the other people and I'd be like, I don't think I'm, you know, I think there was, I can't think of her, I'm blanking on her name. Is it Nicole Sheridan or Nicole Blonde? Nicolette Sheridan. Nicolette. Nicolette Sheridan. I was auditioning for something and I was like, why do I have a feeling? <laughs> Not me, you know. It was like two blonde, two incredibly beautiful people, and character actor. <laughs> you know, like just in case they're gonna go one way or the other. Right, right. Yeah. Right. Where and I would, on this one? I would. I would just. I would always like just be like, watch how I make it my own. You know, I. I always. I would always just try to make people laugh, and then if they tell, you know, sometimes they would say all right, that was really funny. Now do it the way we want to do it. Uh, <laughs> yeah. I did that with, uh, uh, they when they called me, were you ever on Seinfeld? I don't think we've ever had this. I no, can't. I auditioned for it once, but I, I didn't ever, I never got to do it. I, I got this crazy call to be on the last, one of the last 10 shows. And they said, we really don't know what, part we want you to do so but do you mind just coming in and reading we have a scene but you're not going to play this part but just come in and read it so again it's so confusing because I was like well I don't really know what to be I'm not they're kind of giving me just a test thing that I'm not even going to play so my goal was I said just go in and be hysterically funny don't do the thing is and they laugh they really really laugh but I always remember afterwards that Jerry Seinfeld goes that was really funny now do it the way it's supposed to be <laughs> written. But I thought, in that sense, I thought it worked because I said, you know, I just gotta be really funny with these people. I just have to show that I can be funny. Yeah, and then figure that's out the question thing. mark, right? I mean, it, I mean, especially if you don't know what you're, what part you're auditioning for. I, they said here, re and I've had that experience met so many times you know Richard Lewis and I once read for the same part and we discovered it at the audition <laughs> we were sitting across from each other and all of a sudden we looked we, we had one of these like hey wait a minute are you are you are we reading and we both we were both reading for the same part and in the end Wayne Knight got the part neither one we laughed neither one of us got the part Wayne Knight got the part so sometimes people don't know what they want um, but did you, so tell me about, did you have any like early, before you got on Cheers and then, you know, leading to Frasier, did you have any like good auditions, bad auditions, like things that were memorable? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I mean, I could go on and on, but the best one and, and the thing, I, I mean, what was so great once I got to LA was, you know, all of a sudden it was like, you know, I have old day runners from back then that I, I can't throw anything away, but it, it's like 40 auditions in a month or, you know, like we were, remember pilot season, you were just running oh. around and it was so much, it was so crazy, but you really knew, like I had read so many pilots by the time I read the, the pilot for Frasier that I was like, this is really good. Like you, you, you know, from just 
reading all of them, but, right. but the, my favorite one was going into Sharon, I swear it was Sharon Bialy's office. And I saw everyone, every actress, I'm sure you were there. I saw everyone I knew, we were all the same age, all the same, you saw them all on every audition and we were all there to read for a woman who was giving birth to triplets on the beach during an earthquake for Baywatch. Do you remember that? <laughs> I don't remember that one, but it sounds, it's, it sounded very, film like so many things I've auditioned for, yes. It, everyone was like, hey, you know, like, hey, how are you doing? And then you'd hear them go in the room and you'd hear them and they're like, oh. ah, you know, screaming, doing the birth thing. And then everyone would be, we'd be outside laughing. And then it was your turn to go in and you knew they were all laughing. So you were performing for the people in the waiting room. I don't know who got that, but it wasn't me, unfortunately. I would have loved to have done that. Did you audition for the very famous uh, Jim Brooks pilot with Joan Cusack? That was sort of, that seems like that might have been your... I feel around. like I did. What was it? I just, I remember, uh, that was around 1999. That was, a, the, that was another one where it got down to the sort of the final six people or whatever, and we all went there that this morning. And the casting person came out and said, we're going to do round robin. And you're all going to, we don't know, you're going to play all three parts. I mean, here we go again. You're going to pay, no, I had only prepared for this one thing. They said, all, the guys are going to read all three parts. And the girls are going to read all three parts. And they gave us lunchtime to learn everything. And I always remember that, Tate Donovan said, that's it, I'm leaving. And he laughed. He, he just left. He like, but I was there and and, and I remember it, I had 80,000 pages. And I remember at one point, like when I was, I didn't even remember who I was playing anymore. And I was opposite somebody. And I think it was Wally Langham. I was reading opposite him. And he was the only one who ended up getting a part. But I dropped all my pages. And I remember Jim Brooks saying, well, you're the one who wanted to be in show business. <laughs> I just said, thanks. That's, that's actually not helpful, but thank you. <laughs> and needless to say, I didn't get the part. But I don't know who got the part. But that I remember that was one where, like, literally a thousand people, you know, would read for Something, did you read for Friends ever? That was like, a lot of people oh, read for No, Friends. I was on Frasier. I was already on it. Oh, okay. And I maybe that happened with it because the James Brooks and Joan Cusack thing, that probably came from them working together on broadcast news, don't you think? Yeah, Just, yeah. Well, I mean. Because it was so a big good. deal that she was going to do a show. Like again, in those days, movie people didn't cross over. Yeah, I remember that. I remember reading for something with Joan Cusack and being excited about it, but I, maybe it would be like a guest on that show or something. I was so excited, but then when I went in the room, they said, Joan's not going to be reading you with you. She's just going to be watching. So oh. it's, that was, I said, would you like to put tax on the floor too? Like anything else to make it more <laughs> difficult? So let me get this straight. There's She's flaming. watching. Can you, can you, here's your flaming hoop. Undress, oh, no. <laughs> jump. You gotta laugh. You just go. All right, this is not going to go well, but okay. Here, here we go. Um, so, tell, how did you get on? And cheer, how did you get on Cheers? That must have been incredible. Experience. On Cheers, that was a yeah. funny. That's actually a funny story because I did two. Um, I I did two series for Jimmy Burroughs and the and Charles and Les. Why am I blanking? The, the Charles brothers, Les and Glenn Charles, mm -hmm. the, 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 the people that created Cheers, right? right? They went and made a deal with Paramount and they had like a couple of pilots that they did. And I was in those pilots, so I knew them. And I'd gotten to know Jeff Greenberg, the casting director. Love and him. So, and he, who's fabulous. And so yeah. thank God for Jeff Greenberg. And both of the shows that I did with them were not neither went very far we made like 11 of the first one but only only aired five and we made a couple of the second one and I don't think they ever even aired it so, but so I was walking I, for some reason I was in his office and he said Perry um read this scene I have just racked my brains for someone to cast 
and I just can't, I can't think of an actress. Maybe you can think of someone because you know, our joke is everybody is what they are. Jeff loves to say this. Everybody has their job that they do. And, but their second job is a casting director. Like everybody's a casting director. So it's who do you think? And so I read it and I'm like, I don't know. I was just had lunch with Andrea Dishy. She would be so perfect for this, you know? And I was thinking of actresses and he goes, well, do you want to do it? Cause we'd like for you to do it. <laughs> I was like, yes, he just was, you know, he was just fooling me, you know, it was really oh. nice. So I got, that's how I got to do that, which was great. So then I go in and then they all just, um, they threw spitballs at me the whole time I was on that set. But it was so much fun. It was the fourth to last episode of Chairs. It was wow. a ring circus. Jimmy was shooting segments of other shows, shows that had already aired that he needed, not aired, but he finished, but he needed to finish up. And then he was pre-shooting stuff for the finale. And he just was standing there, you know, just like what's it called the conductor just with this mm -hmm. chaos going all around him and he just had complete control and it was a really great experience i was so glad i got to do that it must have been an electric feeling with the audience too were the audience just like crazed crazed they couldn't get enough <sighs> you know and that and the show was just so the show the actors were just all so well, you know them, you know, I mean, yeah. it, there's never been anything like it. They were sort of like, it was sort of like a, I, I well, like a fraternity <laughs> or a sorority combined, you know, they just did what they wanted to do. And they had so much fun doing it. Like one day, Kirsty Alley, I said something to her about she had her baby on the set. And I said, you know, there's this adorable uh, kids clothing store next, you know, on, on La Cienega. And she goes, do you want to go to lunch? You know, and I went, I just looked behind me. I didn't know who she was talking to. And, and she goes, you, do you want to go to lunch? And I go, yeah, she goes, well, we'll go to the place, you know, the, the tea room next to the children's store. So we go. And then I see her in the children's store and she's just, she's not eating. She's not doing it. She's shopping. So I, I say to her assistant, I think we should maybe get her lunch to go so we can get back, you know, and he goes, Oh, that's not happening. <laughs> she, she, she's not rushing back. And I'm like, you have to take me back. You have to. They won't fire her, but they'll fire me. You know, and so I, they dropped me off. They dropped me off at the front of Paramount so I could get back to rehearsal. But, but she knew what she was doing and they trusted her and she knew she didn't, you know, yeah. it was sort of like I, a party there. It was a party. It's so interesting to me because obviously Frasier is in the same like world as Cheers. Yeah. But you played, you didn't play Roz on Cheers. So were there any issues when you were auditioning for Frasier, like continuity? Like what if we see Perry in this show, but then also in this show? I don't think so. I don't think they even thought of it. In fact, we, I think I was, I think I was actually auditioning for Frasier while I was on, I was in that process of it while I did that episode, I think, or they were talking about it. Cause you know, they literally shot the, finale of cheers and then like tore down you know broke down that set and i think they sent that set to the smithsonian or, or something and then i think they yeah. shot the fraser pilot like a couple of weeks later not, wow. not much longer later so it was a you know and i think kelsey said something to me and i said i'm you know i'm auditioning for it or something like that and then someone threw something at me and i <laughs> am thrilled that they threw stuff at me i felt like part of the gang i wasn't upset about it it was just yeah. like, you can see it when you watch the episode you can see stuff sticking <laughs> in the pilot in the episode of cheers that i did oh and she gotcha on cheers yeah on cheers yeah that so was fun. the initiation so ritual they they shot spitballs at you it was awesome oh my gosh i love that yeah it was fun and so then moving over to fraser but again it, we are talking about a time where it did seem like it was a little easier to audition you got once you got the part you didn't have a fear that you would get fired. You know, there was just a little bit more, I don't know, a little more fun, I think, in those days, I think, to be, you know, part of a show. Um, but what, what, tell me about, like, the early days of doing Frasier. Did your character change from initially? Because it always seems like TV is a little bit like an amoeba. You know, you get a rhythm and then you sort of figure out who you are and then the character changes. Or did she remain the same? No, no. I, and I remember it was because Ted Danson had said something so great at, in some interview 
that I heard him say, he goes, I, I didn't know who Sam was for the first couple of years. And, and so that stuck in my head because you know, with sitcoms, you don't, you could find out after six years that you had a brother you never knew anything about, or, you know, you, you find out a new thing about your character every week. So you, you know, the writers always go, don't get stuck in something, you know, and like, you know, at one point, Eva Marie Saint came and played my mother and she was the, 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 the attorney general of Wisconsin, you know, and so sometimes they'd say stuff to me and I'd go, I am the daughter of the attorney general of Wisconsin. And they'd go, don't get that stuck in your head. Don't, you know, don't, don't, don't think that means, you know, they were joking too, but it's sort of like, you have to stay fluid, right? Yeah. And so little that you can hold on to that is defining about your character. But mm-hmm. I feel like they wrote such a defining character and it just kept getting, they kept writing to, to, you know how sitcoms are when they see what works between you and somebody they'll go there more but they have to see what works and I remember once and I don't mean this to put anybody down it was a wake up for me and I've told this story before and it sounds like I'm being and I wasn't I was this is a good story I was supposed to be doing something and Kelsey goes what would Kirsty do right now you know and I went like like you know like I'm not bringing it, you know, I gotta be, I gotta, now it's, I gotta do this, you know? And so I came up with something they loved and I, it it broke me out of my shyness. I think I was kind of shy at first. I didn't want to step on toes and it was Kelsey's show and he wanted you to come and play, you know? And so once he said that and I did that and I got the reaction from Jimmy and Kelsey that, yeah, that's what we need you to do. We need you to think of stuff and feel free and bring everything you got, then I felt like I could create her more. The I also think the addition of the audience adds something because then when you perform it live, people laugh at different, oftentimes they laugh at a moment in between, you're not even saying anything funny. Yeah, and, and the, before the audience gets there, you have the crew, the camera crew, you know, when they come in and they start laughing and to me that they're like, that's the acid test. Don't right. even, you know, cause they really, they see it all. And they don't, they're not, they don't have to laugh. <laughs> this is work. So, you know, it went to so that, that was always a great step for me. And then when the audience got there, it was like, that's when the party started. And they're like a character, you know, yeah. their reactions take you all over the place. Do you think that having such a large ensemble cast where everybody is so talented, did that ever feel intimidating or did it make you feel like you're in a great Broadway play where you really got to bring it? You know, not every week you don't have, maybe have smaller lines one week, one week you got a huge part, but how did that feel being in such a talented cast? It, I was, I felt intimidated a lot, but I felt challenged and they were always there. Everyone was there for each other, you know, and so many more of my scenes were with Kelsey and he was just a, great scene partner I mean he was just solid as a rock you know right there so my my uh my game I think got better because I had to keep up with him do you uh, did you ever wa- watch or study the other what the other characters were doing you know and think because sometimes I find that a challenge I'll look at somebody else getting a laugh and then I try to figure out some way you know that I can then get a laugh I don't know, it's, it's hard, you know, just watching people. It, as I said, the show, everybody's so talented. I always honestly felt, I love getting laughs. There's nothing like it's the best feeling in the world. Yeah. But I always felt part of it if I gave someone the great setup for, for them to get the laugh, you know? Right. So I would watch, you know, how people set each other up and how that worked. And there was, it got spread around pretty, pretty great on Frasier. We all got a chance to do both. But, you know, everybody had a different process and we were all really open to each other's process and they weren't the same. Yeah. So it was interesting that, and when people would come in on and guest, we would sort of try to give them their space and say, you know, you, this is, you're here and we want this to be good. So you do whatever you need to do to get there, you know, and then John Mahoney would run up to them right before curtain, right before we went on and go, don't fuck up, don't fuck up, you know, just... I always, when I guessed it, I, I was very intimidated because I was such a fan of the show, you know, and that's how I felt. Like, like don't screw up, don't screw up. What? Have fun, didn't you have oh, fun? 
it was a, it was so I was in heaven, you know. Like I said, half of me is I'm just such a fan of people in show business that that oftentimes it's the I I feel like there's part of me that's just being a like somehow I got to be on the show and then I have to remember oh wait a minute I actually have to be good I'm not just here as a fan you know I have to do my a game I remember something really funny happened that. They had something with a, a fan that they were going to eat lunch with us. Do you remember that story? <laughs> yes, vaguely. What happened? That's a good story. I remember. Well, they had a, a couple that won a rap. They, they came, the stage manager came. We did the, the read through whatever one particular day. And they said, by the way, everyone, remember that today at lunch, you know, we're, this, this couple won this raffle to eat lunch with the cast and then um so what happened was that they sent the couple into a room and I, for some reason i was the only one in the room <laughs> and uh and i then we were where there was we were waiting for just an incredibly lot like is anybody else gonna come to the show aside from her uh and i think but i remember that they that the couple was walking around, right? And then the, the punchline was that they found out it was the wrong couple. They, <laughs> yeah, they grabbed somebody. Yeah, they got the wrong people. And so they brought them in this room with me and this person, they were having lunch with me. And I was like, where is everybody? Like this is, they were the wrong couple. I remember that, that's hilarious. But remember yeah. that, you know, with lunches and stuff, it would be like, that, that's also when you'd go do your costume change and your, your fitting or you do all these other things yeah. at that time so not everybody was going to lunch at the same time everyone was just like and and we didn't you know so i think it was just sounds like it was a big cluster sorry about that oh <laughs> major cluster. Thing, another thing that was so great about the show is um i very much miss you know witty comedy i feel like we don't have witty comedy anymore and that was a show that you know, wordplay and language was so important to the show. And do you think it, do you think a show would, do you think Frasier would translate as much today? People sure watch it. They watch it. They still watch it. it, you know? Oh, um, all right, we got to talk, let's talk about your new show before I run out of time. So <laughs> your new show, because it's so much fun. Oh my God, we didn't even talk about we got to spend 30 seconds. We, we did a pilot together, which was super fun. I was wondering if you were going to bring it up. I, again, I'm astonished. I don't know how the show, it was called Women of a Certain Age. It was me, Perry Gilpin, and Heather Locklear. And we all got along great. I thought it was a really funny premise. The pilot was insane. People were freaking out and we didn't get picked up. And the next year they did men of a certain age and that went on. There you so, go. What do you think happened with that? Why didn't that show get, I'm still upset about it. I don't know. I don't know. I was but so that, bummed. I really wanted to work with you. I thought I wanted I, to work with you. I, I, I love my like, effort and We you. had so much fun for two weeks. I know. I and know. I loved Heather. She was like rock and roll chick. I thought she was great. We had like such great chemistry. I agree. I agree. I remember you dancing. You were doing like Michael, That my, what comes to mind is you doing Michael Jackson. You were doing a Michael Jackson, um, like thriller dance. It was, <laughs> it was very funny. <laughs> yeah. I always dance and, and that's my sort of my thing on sets. I sing and dance. Uh, I don't know why. It's just like a weird thing about in my old my old theater days or maybe it's a past life all right let's talk about old guy um which is this show it's a humorous take on ageism and how'd you get involved with the show the 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 production the women from the production company it's called five sisters productions and they um they two of them are old friends that i met when i first moved to la maria and ursula and so they would tell these hilarious stories about their dad and mom their dad was the head of the psychology department at SUNY Buffalo, and their mom was a writer. And they, they would just tell these hilarious stories. Their mom and dad were just like kind of not hippies, but just very, 
academics, you know? And so when he retired, he came out to LA and he started auditioning and he sort of started pursuing his old dream of being an actor from 1953. He'd taken like a big, huge, long break. And then he, so he was in his eighties and they were like, Perry, you will not believe it. Our dad is on fire. He is auditioning. He gets every audition. He's worked more than any of us all put together. You can't believe, it. but he plays like, you know, a cadaver or, you know, an adult diaper wearer or, you know, the lecherous man at the bar, you know? And so he, that he was, they, they decided to write this script about it. And when they gave it to me, it was just a very natural progression from knowing them for so long, knowing about their parents then them telling me this story and then them handing me the script. And I was like, this is great. You've captured the business. You've captured, you know, what I think what an agent does has to do. I thought I really loved the character that they asked me to play. Mm -hmm. And they wrote this Valentine's for their mom and their dad who plays uh, Harry. And I just was like, this is fantastic. So it was really fun to do. And, and, and I did all my scenes in one day. So it was just like a crazy whirlwind. And that was back in 2013. It's been a while since I did it, since we did it. And so it's out now. Yeah, I, I, I think that they, I think both their parents felt ill, you know, at, right after their mom did right after and then their dad did after that. And I think they've been taking care of parents. One is a professor at Tufts. One lives in Ohio and a filmmaker and documentary maker. So I just think everybody's been trying to do other things. And I think this, this category, this Emmy category is very new. It's only about four years old. So I think once they kind of learned about it and realized that they could qualify for it, they just decided to go for it, you know, in memory of their parents. And it's an amazing message for their parents to leave us with because it's very funny. And it's also so good natured and, and big hearted, sweet. Well, it's funny, at the top of the show, we were talking about Carl Reiner. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the, this amazing career, and he never let his age be an issue. He just kept rebranding himself, yeah. doing something else. And as people are living longer, you know, yesterday, Olivia de Havilland was 104. I know, I know. <laughs> I know. So. Crazy. It, 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 I mean, it. It really gives you some some hope, though, that you really think, well, you know, maybe it's doable, you know, 100. So, well, the other thing about Carl is, you know, we've known him since the 50s. He he grew old in the business and he never lost his his he never lost his charm or his talent. I just saw him get honored at the Paley Television Museum about six months ago and he spoke. And he was hilarious. I tried to go see him speak at the Television Academy a couple of years ago, and we drove all the way across town. And they like met us at the door and said, "It is packed. I'm sorry, I know yeah. you signed up, but I mean, he just drew in people." And so I think that's, and he never lost his talent. He never lost his ability to express how, his thoughts and how funny he thought, you know. Yeah. And so, but, but Harry, you know, was just sort of starting out at 80, <laughs> so there weren't a lot. He's kind of, there's not a lot for him to do, you know, there's not a lot. I mean, it's hard to find roles that, because people didn't really know him. Yes. What do you think it takes to change? Because I feel that way too. We do. I, I feel like there's not enough old people's stories being told. Um, and, you know, do you feel the same or do you, you know, I, there's some, there's Frankie and Blake. Yeah. And they're terrific. You know, I just, I wish almost there were more of them. I, I do too. And I think because of the success of that show and that maybe there will be more. I mean, it's also, it's not, it's all four of those actors are so fun to watch and they're having yeah. such a good time. And, and the, I, I think what's interesting, I heard Ursula say it earlier today, you know, the five sisters, they, they kind of dress their dad up you know, and they had him in an Indiana Jones costume and they have him in a banker's costume, you know, and it's, it's almost like watching these five daughters, you know, play with their dad and get their dad to do all these things. And then he is make, he's having a ball making them laugh, you know, so the, the family, uh, the family project of it is also really comes through in ways that didn't, I didn't expect, but, but I do think one th thing Ursula said today was, you know, my dad was like learning Spanish. He was he was climbing count you know Mount Kilimanjaro two weeks before we shot. He had a very full, rich personal life, 
And he was just so, dis he was so bummed that that wasn't what anyone wanted to know about. They just wanted to see him in a hospital gown, you know? And, and, it, and that, that aspect of it, I think is what, what we, we were missing is seeing how, cause we all learn things from watching TV. Frankie and Gracie and Frankie and Grace and Frankie gave me so much like hope, like great, this, this is fantastic that we, I wanna feel active and look yeah. my old age. I just think there needs to be more of, of that. There's, there never can be too much of it, that's for sure. I love it. I always, I mean, I always like the Ruth Gordon character in movies. Like, I don't really see a Ruth Gordon character anymore. I, I, so many times when you watch old movies, there was always, there was a variety of parts for older women. It wasn't yeah. just like the mean boss or something like that. We'll probably both be auditioning for the mean boss or yes. the <laughs> quirky Hoping to God to get it. <laughs> quirky. Now when I go, I, well, now we're not going to be auditioning at all. But now I got to the point where when I would audition, I would, if I saw somebody like you or Cameron Mannheim, I just go, just go with them. They're like, <laughs> That's how I felt when I saw you. We would say that to each other. I just go get it. Ugh. You get it. Um, yeah, it would be, uh, you know, it'd be, I said, it'd be more fun for me to watch her. <laughs> Um, well, Perry, thank you so much for being on the show. Uh, good luck with Old Guy. How can we see Old Guy? You can see it. It's on YouTube, Vimeo. It's you can see it through Twitter. You can see it through Instagram. I mean, anywhere you go, if you just click, you know, type in Old Guy, you can find it. And all six episodes are literally under like at twenty five minutes. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> so it's quick. It's funny, and it makes you feel good right now. Yeah, that's what we need. Do you think there'll be, con when this is over, do you think there'll be a need for comedy? I keep hoping that there will be, but I don't know. You know, like when this is over, are we going to want to laugh or are we going to be shell-shocked? <laughs> oh God, I don't we need to laugh? We need to laugh. I have it every time now, every once in a while when I laugh, I go, wow, that was a good laugh. I haven't had a good laugh in a long time. I'm very aware of it, you know? Yeah. If something makes me, if something makes me laugh or a movie I, alone in my house, I've taken to applauding the screen. What movies made you laugh the hardest lately? Oh, well, I, I've been watching these comedies old and I know I've seen it a thousand times, but I watched Mr. Blanding's builds his dream house. Oh, okay. That's a good one. I haven't seen and that. in. I, can't tell you how much I laughed. Now, first of all, my grandfather is in it, so I'm sort of cheating. Right, right. But my God, is that a funny movie? It is so <laughs> funny. Uh, Cary Grant. Yes. Myrna I Lloyd. Can't wait to watch it. Just everything about it, the timing, the ke the chemistry. I mean, again, going back to Frasier, the enthusiasm, enthusiasm that the three leads have for doing what they do yeah you know one talks the other one makes a face it's like it's like listening to music you know so it's so delightful um between the script you know the look of the film and these three leads that ba I was I was watching the movie I said okay these are basically the best of all the screwball comedies Cary Grant Melvin Douglas Myrna Loy appeared in yeah. The greatest screwball comedies there, there that were there, and it's a movie in the end that really is about the American dream of of owning a house, and that it's hell, and you go through all these problems, but in the end, it's a very American movie. And I felt I, I know it sounds a little corny, but I really felt good watching the film, and I wish there were more things, obviously, to bring us together. I. I, I you know, like in the old days, comedy shows, things we, water cooler shows, things that we all watch together. Yeah. To all screaming together about things, laughing together is, is so important, I think. Yeah, I totally agree. I hope we get to do that soon. Yeah, before we all are Ruth Gordon, before we're Olivia de Havilland's. <laughs> It's going to be, I'm going to start looking like Papillon, you know, remember Steve McQueen? With the, <laughs> how do I look? 
Um, anyway, Perry, you were delightful. It was so but, much fun. Thank you, Liliana. You're one of the greatest TV comedians. Oh, that's so ever. nice. You are. You're, you're, you have a gift for timing. A, a gift. An absolute gift for timing, I think. You know, because I worked with you too. It, it's so funny when you watch someone and then you work with them and you go, how did she make that line funny? That is not remotely funny. But <laughs> you know how to do it. You do it too. You know how to do that. Sometimes in desperation, <laughs> I push it. But you have a more natural. <laughs> anyway, you're awesome. I adore you. And thanks so much for doing the show. Good luck with old guy. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, Ileana. Okay. Well, as we always, we're going to end the show, as we always uh, say, everyone's life is like a movie with a beginning, a middle, and an end. This is the end of our movie for today. Carl Reiner, make him laugh up there. Have a great day, everyone. Bye. Bye. So sweet. <laughs> Bye. Yay. For producers Maria so Menounos, Kevin Undergaro, and the entire Popcorn Talk Network, we would like to thank you for tuning in. For questions or comments, be sure to visit PopcornTalk.com. I'm Sir Richard Wentworth, and this has been a presentation of the Popcorn Talk Network.